Laboratory Directions for the Female Reproductive System Part 2 Learning Objectives Be able to recognize and describe the histological organization of the cervix and vaginal wall as well as the junction between these two structures. Be able to recognize and describe the histological organization of the placenta in early and late pregnancy and be able to recognize and describe the major histological changes that occur in the female breast as a result of pregnancy and during lactation. This particular section is a section uh, through the vaginal cervical junction and uh, what is shown here in this vertical section, uh, the vaginal wall is indicated by the arrow. As one goes up, if we go into the lumen, this would be the uh, proximal or upper part of the lumen of the vagina. This lumen where the arrow, the tip of the arrow now indicates is a lateral fornix of the vagina. So this region here is vaginal wall. This space is the vaginal fornix and likewise the arrow is now crossing the vaginal wall on the uh, opposite side here. So this would be a stratified squamous type of lining epithelium with the typical elements of the vaginal wall and the space here would be another, the other of the lateral uh, fornices of the uh, vaginal lumen. This is the cervix extending down into the vaginal lumen a little bit. So this is exocervix. The external os would be about this location. And this lumen here is now being traced by the pointer is that of the cervical uh, canal. And then it goes out of the field. So this structure here is cervix, upper or proximal vaginal wall, the fornices located here, and the cervical canal now being indicated by the arrow. This is a region through the mid-cervical canal, uh, the lumen is indicated by the pointer and one can see some strands of uh, mucin uh, coursing down the lumen. One coming uh, <coughs> from the uh, left hand side uh, from the cervical gland. There's a small cluster of glands uh, uh, shown here and then emptying into the canal as now indicated by the arrow. So this is a low power view seen with the scanning objective uh, under the microscope. The arrow now resides within the cervical canal uh, containing that filamentous uh, mucin type of material and we're coursing now uh, towards the proximal vaginal area. This region as shown here is another uh, opening uh, which would be continuous with the large uh, gland as shown here. This is all cervical wall, primarily uh, a dense uh, type of uh, connective tissue. We're now uh, coursing, continuing to course down through the cervical canal. Here we can see another one of the cervical glands. It will be lined by an epithelium similar to that lining the cervical canal itself which is a tall mucus secreting simple columnar epithelium. We're continuing to go through the cervical canal now. This would be approximately the region of the external os. And then if we course laterally, we're now into the vaginal lumen, which is this region here. We're now coursing up the external surface of the uh, 
exocervix, that part of the cervix that extends down uh, into the proximal uh, vaginal area. And notice here we have the very abrupt transition from the simple columnar epithelium lining the cervical area to a stratified squamous non-keratinized variety that's more typically found uh, lining the uh, vaginal surface. So we're actually on the external surface of the cervix, that portion that extends down into the vaginal canal. We're not, we're continuing up the lateral or the outer surface of the cervix that extends down, the exocervix. You can see that its external surface is lined by this non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium here. A cervical wall continues to be in this direction. Now if I move the field over slightly, here is the cervical canal. If we continue to course uh, up the uh, lateral surface of the uh, cervix itself, we will eventually get up and we'll see a bend. So this whole area here that lies this luminal uh, area is the lateral fornicle area, or the lateral fornix in this particular aspect. So if we hold the field here now momentarily, this would be cervical area here. This would be the lumen of the uh, lateral fornix. And then this structure beginning here and going over here is vaginal wall. It'll be lined by the same type of epithelium, a non-keratinized stratified squamous. A laminar propria will be in here, and then we'll see that there's an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle, though it isn't obvious on this particular uh, preparation at that point. And we're simply tracing it back, uh, the field down once again. If we went across the <coughs> exocervix, there's the opening of the cervical canal, and then to the other side, this will repeat itself once again. There will be a lateral fornix uh, shown on this side. So this is cervical wall here, and it's being covered by this non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, the lateral fornix would be uh, this region here, and then vaginal wall going up the tissues uh, torn there uh, out in this particular direction. So this is the scanning view of this particular area as it is seen in its uh, entirety, the exocervix and that junction with the, the uh, vaginal epithelium and the vaginal uh, canal. Perhaps it's worth a, a brief look at the and at increased magnification of the cervical lining type of epithelium, as well as the uh, junction, uh, which should be examined at increased magnification. A short clip of a portion of a cervical gland showing you the tall columnar type of epithelium, and it's a mucosin secreting uh, type of simple columnar epithelium. You can see the mucin being discharged and, uh, and being uh, observed within the uh, lumen of this particular uh, secretory tubule. So these are the uh, cervical uh, glands, their appearance on this particular preparation. We're now coursing towards the uh, lumen. We're now in the cervical lumen. If we course up along this side in particular, you can see, once again, it is a tall columnar type of epithelium of the mucin secreting uh, variety. Though on this particular older preparation, uh, it isn't as pretty as it could be. If we just go underneath it, even though the, the continuity of the ductal system uh, has been lost, some more uh, tubular profiles of the uh, cervical glands. So these are profiles of the secretory units of cervical glands. And it's this type of epithelium that will also line the lumen of the cervix itself.
the cervical canal. We're now approaching up into the uh, along the external surface of the cervix, along the ectocervical area, uh, approaching the lateral fornix. And just to illustrate the junction, we can see that it's a simple columnar type of epithelium, typical cervical epithelium. Here we can even see the remnants of a gland. And then over a very short junction, stratified squamous of the non-keratinized variety uh, on the external surface of the cervix. So in this particular preparation, the junction is uh, right about in here. So it's a little bit confused in here. We're going from a simple columnar. We get a bit of a gland here, but it's a fairly abrupt junction if you get a good cut through it from simple columnar to uh, stratified squamous uh, form of epithelium. This is the junction on the opposite side, or the field on the opposite side. Uh, so this, in the direction the arrow is now indicating, this is we're now on the external surface of the cervix, uh, and up where the arrow is now, it's approaching into the lateral fornix. So here is the simple columnar uh, lining epithelium, and right about at this juncture. Here, we're going from a simple columnar epithelium and right about at this location, a very abrupt junction to this non-keratinized stratified squamous uh, type of epithelium. Unfortunately, it's torn here, but it just repeats itself, obviously, on the other uh, opposite side of the, the cervix, that portion of the cervix extending down into uh, the proximal uh, vaginal canal. Uh, this is the more recent preparation uh, showing the cervical vaginal junction, uh, but the specimen in which the relationships have been lost. Uh, shown here, as indicated by the arrow, a little fold. This is typical cervical canal lining uh, type of epithelium. At this particular point, we are uh, going out of the external loss, though I haven't shown uh, that particular uh, field at low power <coughs> on this specimen. So this is a cervical epithelium. This is a gland that happens to be uh, coming uh, in. And right at the tip of the arrow is the junction, which is shown and perhaps a little bit better than the previous specimen to show the very abrupt nature of this particular junction. Uh, going from a simple columnar mucin secreting type of epithelium to over just a short cell, couple of cell lengths, the abrupt junction to non-keratinized stratified squamous type of epithelium, as is shown uh, to the immediate uh, left of the arrow. So this is the cervical vaginal junction, and a, and a fairly decent one at that. The vaginal cervical junction, uh, or the junction of the epithelium, as indicated by the arrow. Uh, once again, to repeat, this is just that increased magnification. A simple columnar mucin secreting type of epithelium that is typically lines a cervical canal that comes out of the external loss. It, somewhere along uh, that region, it abruptly changes to the non-keratinized stratified squamous type of epithelium that align the external surface of the cervix, that part protruding down into the vaginal canal, as well as the uh, higher vaginal surface. And this is epithelium is now being illustrated uh, to the right of the field and indicated, or to the left of the field, excuse me, and as indicated uh, by the pointer. So this is the cervical vaginal junction as seen at increased magnification. This is just a short clip at increased magnification of the epithelium typical of that lining the cervical uh, canal. 
that is within the beyond uh, the external law. So we're actually within the cervical canal, the lumen of which is now being indicated by the pointer. And this small fold of tissue shows the nature of the simple columnar epithelium uh, lining the cervical canal. It's usually a very tall, simple columnar of a mucin uh, secreting variety. And finally, a portion through one of the cervical glands that had invaginated out or evaginated out from the cervical canal, uh, illustrating that the epithelial continuity, the invaginations coming here from the surface, these profiles of the uh, cervical glands that's grown into the surrounding fibromuscular or fibromuscular type of stroma, mainly a fibro type of stroma of the surrounding cervical wall. So this is a profile of one of the cervical glands. Note that the epithelium forming these glands is almost identical to that lining the cervical uh, canal. The uh, cervical wall or the stroma making up the wall of this particular organ is shown in the surrounding field. It's maybe a fibroelastic type of connective tissue. There is a little bit of smooth muscle, but not nearly uh, in abundance like one would uh, see in the vaginal canal or the oviduct. Just isolated, scattered, uh, smooth muscle cell fibers. Once again, this is the profile illustrating the uh, cervical vaginal junction, that is the junction between the two different types of epithelium as indicated by the pointer. It occurred right at this uh, particular junction, as seen at low magnification. Uh, so <clears throat> the cervical lumen is in this particular, towards the bottom of the field with some infoldings, lined by that typical cervical uh, canal lining epithelium, that tall, simple columnar. And this particular epithelium here is going to line the external surface of the cervix as well. Uh, go looping up and over around, lining the vaginal uh, fornix, and then finally the wall of the vagina. But this particular specimen also shows is that there was a cervical gland that grew in right at the junction, and one sees a large cyst or a fold here. This is an example of one of those nibiathan cysts, a little blister-like cyst uh, filled with usually a uh, type of mucin. Uh, due to the secretion of these cervical glands. If one courses up a little bit, even though it's a stratified squamous type of epithelium, one can see there a cervical gland that had grown down. And it's perhaps continuous over here with another one of these large cyst-like structures. Some of them uh, can reach a rather remarkable size. This is another example in the cervical wall of one of the nibiathan cysts. I'm just coursing around it uh, with the pointer. Uh, as far as I am aware, these are non-pathologic, and uh, but a common observation at this particular in this particular area. The wall of the nibiathan cyst seen at increased magnification illustrating the epithelial type lining uh, the wall of the cyst, and you will note that it is a simple columnar mucin secreting type of epithelium, uh, typical of that lining the cervical canal and uh, what forms the cervical glands. So these nibiathan cysts apparently are simply sort of a plugging up of one of the cervical glands, which becomes filled with and dilated by the secretion uh, that accumulates within it. So this is a portion of a nibiathan cyst as seen at uh, increased magnification to illustrate uh, the lining epithelium. This is another visual view. This time it's a section through the entire wall of a human vagina, though uh, just a portion of a segment, showing 
the lining epithelium, so the lumen is now located where the arrow is of this particular organ. The lining epithelium is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. It is underlied or supported by a rather vascular and thick lamina propria, as indicated by the arrow. And are then, as one would expect, uh, about the location where the tip of the arrow is to the edge of the tissue, a very fairly robust muscularis uh, area. And the muscularis, or the muscular wall of this particular uh, organ, will consist of uh, an inner circular layer, which is a roughly the arrow uh, region now indicated by the arrow. It's a fairly vascular area, and an outer longitudinal layer of a smooth muscle. And then finally, uh, a connective tissue covering an adventitial layer. So as is true of the remainder of the female tract, we have a mucous membrane, or a mucosa, consisting of epithelium and lamina propria, a muscularis, and an adventitia. In this case, the mucosa consists of a wet, non-keratinized, stratified, squamous type of epithelium and lamina propria. This is a section of through the vaginal wall as seen with the scanning lens under the microscope. The arrow indicates the lining epithelium of the vaginal canal, which is a fairly thick stratified squamous epithelium of the non-keratinized variety. It is supported by a relatively thick lamina propria that is fairly well vascularized. Even with the scanning mode, one can make out numerous dilated uh, elements of the vascular system that are containing blood at this particular uh, point and making their um, visibility a little bit easier to uh, see. From about this point where there seems to be a vessel coursing along the surface, this is roughly the beginning of the area of inner circular uh, muscle of the vaginal wall. You can see a very large vessel uh, crossing the field. And then beyond the vessel wall, the fiber direction of the smooth muscle wall changes, and there's more of an outer longitudinal uh, type of a layering uh, to the muscle. Also, one can see numerous vessels and nerves obviously associated with this particular structure. And here one can see, even with the scanning mode, the more of the longitudinal orientation of the uh, outer layering of the smooth muscle wall. And then finally there would be an, a surrounding uh, connective tissue adventitial type of layer. So like the remainder of the uh, female reproductive tract, there is a mucosa or a mucous membrane in this particular case, made up by a stratified squamous type of epithelium of the non-keratinized variety, so it's a wet or non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, as well as the lamina propria, which is quite vascularized, as can be seen in this particular area quite well, making up the mucosa or the mucous membrane. Here are those numerous dilated vessels within the lamina propria of this particular structure. So these elements, the epithelium plus the lamina propria equals the mucosa or the mucous membrane. The muscularis or the muscle wall is made up of an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of uh, smooth muscle. And then finally the third layer, the connective tissue adventitia that unites this particular organ to adjacent structures. A region of the vaginal lining epithelium seen on a slight increase in magnification, showing you that it's a non-keratinized stratified squamous type of epithelium, but in addition showing you the, uh, the basal layer, or the parabasal layer, that layer of the stratum germinotypum and how it stands out 
in a rather uh, remarkable uh, way. And this layer is indicated by the tip of the pointer. The other interesting feature about this stratified squamous type of epithelium is note the vacuolization of the epithelial cells, which is due to the accumulation of glycogen uh, within these particular cells. A region of very early placenta as seen at uh, the intermediate objective. The tissue occupying the field of view is a one of the villous units from the developing, developing placenta and one can see a rather relatively primitive type of connective tissue, a mesenchymal type of tissue occupying the core of this particular uh, placental villus that's being observed with the formation of a small blood vessel occurring at this location. Note the uh, surrounding trophoblastic cells. They are subdivided into two layers at this particular point or two various cell types. The layer shown at the tip of the pointer which is made up of a sort of a simple columnar type of epithelium as indicated here is the cytotrophoblast that covering layer with the extremely dark nuclei and looks like a fusion of cells being put together is the syntrophoblast and will border the uh, maternal blood which lakes which are going to be where the pointer now indicates. So this is a placental villus or a portion thereof from an early placenta showing you to the two cell types that cover these uh, placental villi which are filled with a primitive mesenchymal type core. First of all the syntrophoblast with the extremely dark nuclei and then the taller more cellular appearing uh, tall columnar epithelium the cytotrophoblast. And if one moves the field and looks at adjacent villi these units simply repeat themselves uh, over and over again. So this is a region of uh, very early uh, human placenta as seen with the intermediate objective. The same region of the former placental villus at increased magnification to illustrate the cell types perhaps a little bit better of the uh, surrounding trophoblast. The outer layer of cells which are fusing into this mass of cells with the extremely dark staining nuclei forms the syncytial trophoblast, whereas the underlying uh, layer uh, or that layer next to the villous core of connective tissue, uh, this cell layer forms the cytotrophoblast. Roughly a simple columnar type of epithelium that has a much more cellular or epithelial type of appearance to it as compared with the overlying uh, syncytial trophoblast. So this is the portion of the villous wall as seen at high magnification uh, illustrating the uh, those two uh, various cell types associated with the placental villus. This particular field is uh, shows several portions of uh, placental villi but from a near term uh, placenta. Note in particular the change within the core of the villus, the more uh, well-developed vascular cores within each uh, placental villus, as well as the change in the epithelium that's covering these, uh, each of the individual placental villi. The cytotrophoblast has largely disappeared at this point, and the syntrophoblast forms the outer lining epithelium, that is the syncytial trophoblast. 
Note also the marked increase in vascularity of these placental villi. And note the position of the vasculature in association to the overlying uh, centrophoblast. Uh, looking at this particular uh, portion of a villus, note how the capillaries have come right next to the surface, immediately underlying the uh, overlying centrophoblast. Another example is shown here, and another uh, fairly decent example is shown in this particular location. So there's a tremendous increase in the vascularity, as well as the positioning of these vessels, uh, capillaries, immediately beneath the centrophil blast, so an exchange can take place between the maternal lakes of blood, which would be, uh, as indicated by the pointer, this is the, uh, would be the maternal circulation or pooling of blood. The uh, blood cells of the fetus, of course, are going to be housed within the small capillaries within the cores of the villi. So what we're looking at is this exchange barrier, this placental barrier between a fetus and mo mother, which would lo be localized here or right along uh, in this particular location. This is perhaps one of the most important features to observe on these particular sections. This particular <coughs> region has that same mature placenta, or near-term placenta, perhaps would be the best way of describing it, uh, as seen at high magnification, showing you the syntrophal blast once again which is being indicated and traced by the pointer. Here we see the cytoplasm of the syntrophoblast coursing here, and then the nucleated region uh, assumes its appearance once again. Syncytial trophoblast up here as well on this particular placental villus. <coughs> However, what one should direct one's attention to is the vascularization and the nature and the position of the capillaries. Here is a capillary containing red cells. The arrow is now within the lumen of this particular uh, small blood vessel. It's coursing along this direction. Note the very thin barrier between fetal blood and maternal blood. This is a, that blood placental barrier made by the cytoplasm of the syncytial trophoblast. And if one <coughs> thinks about it perhaps just a little, it reminds one of the situation that was observed in the lung in the exchange between of gases. A similar mechanism, uh, a morphological mechanism, almost exists here where you have a thin cytoplasmic barrier uh, allowing the exchange between uh, the placenta at the fetal circulation and that of the mother. Another vessel is coursing along here. A few red cells are retained within the lumen of the capillary. It's empty here. But once again, here is that very thin barrier separating fetal from maternal blood, which would be located at this location. So that's one of the interesting observations that should be made when looking at the, uh, this term placenta. And just coursing along, one can see uh, there's a cross-section of a smaller villus. Another one is shown here. The nature of the blood vessels and the overlying uh, syncytial trophoblast separating uh, maternal and uh, fetal blood. Here in this particular preparation, one can uh, see some of the barrier. Here's syncytial trophoblast here. This is probably the capillary endothelial lining here in the red cell. So here you can see that little barrier uh, once again and note its similarity uh, to the respiratory system. And this simply repeats itself over and over again. Note the maturity of the connective tissue within the core of the villus, the lateral position of the vasculature immediately beneath the basement membrane of the syncytial trophoblast. You see, one can see that. And the loss of the cytotrophoblast at this point. Most of the cells are indeed of a uh, syncytial uh, trophoblast uh, type. So this is just a high-powered view 
of a uh, near-term placenta or the placental villi is seen at uh, increased magnification. An additional term placental villus, sort of isolated and surrounded by maternal blood, but illustrating quite crisply the feature just discussed, the villus core with the contained capillaries that are now positioned immediately beneath the syncytial trophoblast. Here one can see endothelial uh, cells or the nuclei thereof and the capillary wall and its position immediately beneath the basement membrane of the syncytial trophoblast and the, as one focuses in and out around this uh, uh, particular vellus uh, that relationship uh, is shown in other positions. Just to give one an idea the thinness of this barrier between fetal and then maternal blood which would be located here. Here's another tiny little portion of a villus illustrating those very uh, similar fi features showing the thinness of this uh, syntrophoplastic layer. Uh, so these are fairly good examples of this particular feature that characterizes uh, the uh, term placenta and, and the exchange mechanism uh, that occurs. This is a small region of uh, fairly early human placenta. It's a frozen section, one is, uh, of which has been uh, reacted immunocytochemically to demonstrate human chorionic gonadotrophic uh, hormone. So these are some of the trophoblast cells and the brown precipitous type of material indicates the presence of that uh, glycoprotein, human chorionic gonadotrophic hormone. And one can see the other trophoblast type cells in this particular area are also uh, demonstrating a positive reaction to this particular uh, signal. Uh, even though the specimen is a little bit twisted around and we can't get a good vertical cut uh, through some of these structures, nonetheless uh, this is what a positive reaction uh, would look like for this particular uh, glycoprotein hormone. That sort of brown precipitous label uh, indicating the presence, positive presence of this particular uh, hormone, human chorionic gonadotrophic uh, hormone. This particular field represents a section of immature human breast tissue. The major ducts are shown and indicated by the arrow in this uh, view as looked at with the uh, scanning objective. Note that these major ducts uh, of the interlobular ca category lie within a fairly uh, dense fibrous type of connective tissue, collagen, elastic fibers, and fibroblasts, and a considerable amount of fat in the surrounding area. Now if one moves the field and continues to examine this particular section, other examples of smaller caliber ducts will also uh, be observed in this uh, connective tissue seam, but these also are uh, branches of this interlobular duct system and most of these ducts at this stage of development will be lined by a stratified columnar uh, type of epithelium. One can get a hint at that perhaps in this, these two sections of these major uh, ductal profiles in the, this immature breast material. And again some other smaller caliber uh, ducts in this growing system. When examined at higher magnification, virtually all of these will be of a stratified uh, columnar nature at this point in development, again indicating that these are major uh, ducts and form the interlobular system, uh, which will, uh, smaller uh, caliber ducts will de then develop uh, from this ductal group. 
a portion of the wall of that major interlobular duct of the immature breast showing you two distinct layers of cells, the superficial most or the luminal most one of which is more of a columnar uh, shape, satisfying the definition of a stratified columnar type of epithelium. If one moves the field in this immature breast section to some of the much smaller caliber uh, types of ducts, uh, one can look at them carefully and once again see the stratified columnar nature. If we look at this region right here, a basal layer of nuclei, the nuclei of the upper cells located here, and then the apical cytoplasm. So even these smaller caliber uh, ducts within this particular section are all stratified uh, columnar in nature, indicating that in, in this immature breast uh, material, these are all going to be the, of the interlobular duct system. Here's one that's sort of branching or cutting it at the branch, but if one looks at the wall, those that remain intact of this growing ductal system, one will appreciate the fact that these are indeed all lined by a stratified uh, columnar form of epithelium, indicating that this ductal system is the primary or the major one uh, and is forming first. Uh, in successive stages, the other elements of the ductal system will form by from these then established ducts. This is an example of human breast tissue taken from early in pregnancy. Now, the large ducts, as seen and indicated by the pointer, are those ducts seen in the previous section at the earlier stage of development or in the immature stage. Uh, from these established ducts, now one will see proliferating from them another series or a collection of ducts. These are going to form the intralobular duct system. And if one courses throughout the field, one will see that the fat has uh, decreased somewhat. And there's a development or a primitive development of what appear to be lobules and lobes. Once again, these are the profiles of ducts lined by a stratified columnar type that were observed in the previous section in the immature state. These now are well established and from them are growing out, as indicated here at the tip of the arrow, another series of structures indicating a small lobule here, a lobule will be forming here, a lobule will be forming here. All of these smaller profiles are profiles of the intralobular duct system. So they are going to form the heart of lobules. And from these intralobular ducts will form the tubules of the mature breast, of a lactating breast. So this is roughly all one can see uh, when examining uh, this particular specimen. And it repeats itself over and over again. Once again, the major interlobular ducts and the establishing intralobular ducts that are growing out into the connective tissue and will form the core, the heart of the ductal system within the individual uh, lobules. This whole organization here will then form a lobe of breast tissue, each one of the surrounding components uh, making up the lobules within that lobe. So it's in the initial stages of proliferation, growing, and establishing itself at this point uh, in development. This now represents a section through a portion of mature lactating breast tissue. At the tip of the pointer is the main duct of this particular lob, or an interlobular duct. This would be the ductal system established in slide one, which originally was lined by a stratified columnar 
type of epithelium. Now extending from it and growing during pregnancy is the intralobular duct system. A profile is here and a profile is growing in this particular direction on this one. So this would, those would be those elements that were being established on slide number two in the uh, pregnant breast. All of this material in this lobule, these secretory tubules, this is obviously a compound tubular alveolar type of gland. Well, these tubules forming this small lobule have grown out from the intralobular duct. And you can see here's where some of the secretory tubules are actually joining this intralobular uh, duct system. So this is the trend or the tendency uh, that uh, one should observe, that sequence of events, an immature breast, what happens during pregnancy, and now what the breast would look like in uh, full lactation. If we move the field slightly, similar events are observed but in cross-section. So this would be the major interlobular duct, stratified columnar lining that was seen being established in uh, slide number one, the immature breast. And growing from it, here's a little profile, would be the, uh, even though it's in the connective tissue a little bit, the uh, interlobular duct system. But this is the ductal system that's being established. And then it would split and go into the heart of these smaller lobules, as indicated here. And then from around it, this intralobular duct system, the tubules late in pregnancy and early in lactation will develop and uh, start in the production of milk uh, in the postpartum period, a few days thereafter. So this is a se sequence of events best seen with the scanning power uh, that one uh, should appreciate on this particular set of three slides. A region of some of the secretory tubules of lactating breast seen at high magnification. One of these tubules is shown here, another here, another here, and another here, and so on and so forth. Note that in some of the uh, epithelial cells, one can make out what appear to be lipid droplets within the apical cytoplasm. And some of these, of course, will also be found uh, within the proteinaceous secretion within the lumen. Like here, it looks like a, uh, a little fat droplet uh, at this location sort of matches what, what's seen and within the epithelium itself that are being uh, secreted and are part of uh, the uh, milk system or the maternal milk. Probably protein that forms this uh, reddish cast uh, that's precipitated out. But even in uh, that, one can make out occasionally these light, clearer areas of a lipid, what appears to be a lipid type of uh, uh, material. So this, these are some profiles of the tubules of lactating breast as seen at uh, increased magnification.